play again. Um, but let's go ahead and finish up with the digestive system. Okay. What color? What color should you do? Let's try green. Try green. All right. Let's go ahead and get these questions answered. Okay. The All right, so this is the pancreas. Come on. The pancreas is an organ that stretches across the back of the abdomen behind the stomach. Um, most pancreatic cells produce pan uh, pancreatic juices. which enters the duodenum um, with the small intestine via the pancreatic duct. So pancreatic, good gosh, pancreatic juices contain sodium bicarbonate. Remember this from the small intestines that we just did with the sodium bicarbonate. Um, pancreatic amylase, which is again our starch, Breaker downer, it's a scientific term. Breaker downer. Oh, did I add that extra? There we go. Um, and then we have trypsin, it's our protein breaker downer enzyme. And then we have something called pancreatic lipase. LI lipase, LI lipid. Okay, so these break down fats, lipids. Um, the pancreas is also an endocrine gland because it releases the hormones um, insulin and glucagon, and this is to do with blood sugar regulation, but they're not gonna talk about glucagon in this chapter, okay? Hang on. Ezra, you got a hush. Fortnite battle. Um, I have a, a nice gaming PC, thanks to a good friend of mine who built it for me. And I enjoy gaming, but I do not like Fortnite. It feels so slow. I feel like you just run around the map waiting to be killed or to find somebody to kill. And I just don't like it. I don't have the patience to play it, I guess. I played a new game recently called, to, I, was, I think it's called Phantomophobia, and it's in its beta stage. It's pretty good. Um, you're like ghost hunters and you have to go in with your little arsenal of tools and identify what kind of ghost is haunting this house. And it's kind of creepy. It really is kind of creepy. Um, but it's best played in with at least two people. If you do it by yourself, it takes four. Anyway, like I said, beta stage, but it's pretty fun. I think it was like 13 or 14 bucks. And I think I got it off of Steam. Anyway, we're looking for a new game to kill some time in the midst of all of our lovely COVID stuff. There you go. All right, moving on. Let's talk about the liver. So the liver is actually considered a gland, and in fact, it's considered the largest gland in the body, and it has both exocrine and endocrine functions. Okay. 
Um, the liver's job is to detoxify blood. Okay. Um, it also helps to the storing of vitamins. So in addition to that, it has glucose regulatory functions. There we go. Um, and what it does is if there's excess glucose in the system, um, it gets converted to something called glycogen and then the liver stores that glycogen. Um, if blood sugar levels drop, um, the liver can cause, you know, have chemical reactions take place that convert the glycogen back to glucose and then release it into the bloodstream um, to regulate sugar levels. And then if this isn't available, um, it also actually can take amino acids and make glucose out of amino acids. Pretty impressive. It's cool because, you know, amino acids are the monomers for another macromolecule, proteins. And so they're essentially taking the amino acid monomer from proteins to build the um, monosaccharide monomers for sugar. Kind of cool. Okay, so the liver forms something called urea, which comes from ammonia. Um, So when you have ammonia and carbon dioxide, you get urea, okay? Breaks down hemoglobin. So essentially what that means is, um, you know, red blood cells have a lifespan. And so as the red blood cells end their lifespan, the liver takes the heme molecules off of them. Um, And then that heme is converted into something called bilirubin. jaundice and bilirubin in a minute. All right, so it also makes and secretes bile into the gallbladder. Here's the ingredients for bile. We've got cholesterol, hemoglobin, bilirubin, and something called bile salts. Okay, so all of that mixes together and its job is to emulsify fats. Okay, um, those fats get broken down into smaller droplets so that they're easier to digest. Now let's talk about the gallbladder. So the gallbladder is responsible for storing and secreting bile. So I just want to point out again that it's the liver that makes and secretes the bile. Okay. 
but the gallbladder stores it. So if you see a question like this on an exam, don't, um, don't be tricked into putting that the gallbladder is what makes it. It doesn't. The liver makes it, secretes it to the gallbladder. The gallbladder secretes it into the small intestines. Okay. Question of the day, where are your taste receptors? Um, okay, so if you look at this image over here, I'm actually gonna look at the bigger uh, version on my other screen here so I can see that better. Um, it's showing the digestive system, the digestive tract. You've got the esophagus here coming into the stomach and then this lovely winding mass is supposed to be small intestine moving into the larger intestine. And it's showing um, these different groupings of um, receptors, essentially. And when it talks about taste receptors, we're not really talking about the same type of experience that you're having like on your tongue with the taste buds. These are actually chemoreceptors that are able to determine what types of um, substances you put in your digestive tract. So in the digestive tract, it's the presence of these different molecules that we eat that actually triggers the release of the enzyme that will break it down. So in the example of um, lactose, it's the presence of the lactose itself that would be responsible for triggering the release of the enzyme lactase, okay? Without lactose in the system, lactase is not gonna be out there wandering around looking for something to break down. Um, it's the chemoreceptors in the digestive tract that will bind to that specific substance, recognize it, and then trigger a chemical reaction that releases the enzyme to come in and break that down. So again, it's through these different chemoreceptors that are located at these different places in the digestive tract that actually allows us to identify or allows the body to identify what's been ingested um, secrete the proper enzyme to break it down, and then it actually can also know if um, we've in, ingested something that has been harmful, that doesn't belong there, okay? Okay, let's talk about jaundice. So jaundice is the result of bilirubin that's built up in the tissues. Okay. And again, bilirubin is the byproduct of heme breakdown, heme from hemoglobin in the blood. And it creates a yellowish pigment in the skin, um, the whites of the eyes. Um, so they kind of are showing, you know, on one half a healthy person on the other side. I have seen some people that have a rather shockingly marked yellow pigment to their skin um, when they've been very sick, usually before death. Um, this diagram is showing something really extreme. A lot of times you'll notice more of a yellowish tinge. It's most noticeable in the whites of the eyes but as far as the skin turning bright yellow, not usually. Again, in really extreme cases or something that's very sick or close to death, it can be very marked. Um, when it comes to jaundice, so babies are often jaundice and it's because their little livers aren't quite up and, and 
ready for the task of breaking down the red blood cells. And so they can have this buildup of bilirubin, um, which you can usually see in the whites of their eyes. It is true that Caucasian babies um, tend to suffer from it a little bit more. Um, but, you know, they usually want you to, to take the child out into the sun because the sun helps with the breaking down of this and getting the liver up and running. More extreme cases, they can put them in a, a light box that has the same type of rays essentially as the sun for the same purpose. But it's more intensive therapy because the baby has to stand in that light box for hours until um, the bilirubin in the system can be eliminated. And then within a few days, um, usually the liver's up and running like it should and takes care of itself. For adults that have jaundice, um, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, which we talked about down here, hepatitis, um, uh, cancers, um, anything that's affecting the function of the liver can cause jaundice because the liver's not doing its job or it's not able to function as well, okay? Hepatitis. Hepatitis is an inflammation. of the liver, okay? It's caused by a virus. As you know, you can't kill viruses because they're not alive, so there's not antibiotic you can take. Um, there are some treatments and there are also vaccinations to help prevent you contracting it. There's three different types, hepatitis A, Hepatitis A comes from usually contaminated water. So yeah, contaminated water, we're really talking about feces here. And either you drink the water or the water has been used to like prepare food or like wash vegetables, something like that, and then you eat it and you can contract it that way. Um, HEP B is an STD or STI, as they're often commonly called now. Um, you can also get them through needle sharing, drug users, IV drug users, and blood transfusions. So this is more blood borne rather than a contaminant. And then you have uh, hep C, which is also something that is more through the blood. Um, again, infected blood, but also a complication of liver cancer. And it can cause death. Hepatitis is also fairly common um, among people that have contracted HIV. Um, so that, that's another cool issue, if you will, a lot of times. All right, so cirrhosis. This is where healthy tissue is replaced essentially with scar tissue in the liver. So the scar tissue is non-functional. So it essentially takes over the healthy part of the liver um, so that you kind of have this mass of non-functioning tissue, okay? Um, alcoholism is a common cause um, of cirrhosis. Um, and in some cases, um, diets that are very high in fats. So if you have a really fatty diet, it can increase your chances of liver cirrhosis. Fun. Okay, let's move on to the large intestine. All right, 
large intestine. This is where I get to use the word, the words I should say, sphincter, feces, and rectum, and anus. I mean, come on, when else do you get to use all of those words in a day, right? Like, when was the last time you used all of those words in a day? You're so lucky, now you're gonna hear them all. Okay, so the large intestine is where a lot of water absorption takes place because this is where we're gonna have the drying out and the storage of, first word of the day, feces. Okay. This is the rest of the water when we get to the kidneys, you'll see that there's actually kind of a, a complex relationship um, with the kidneys and the rest of the, of the body, including the digestive tract, because you have to, you know, your body has to be able to know how much water it can pick up again. For instance, if you're severely dehydrated, your body is going to attempt to reabsorb as much water as possible. Um, Whereas if you're well hydrated, it can afford to let go of a lot of the water that, you, that comes in. Um, if, you, if you are dehydrated severely, it can lead to constipation type issues um, because all of this becomes too dried out and impacted. So anyway, there's a relationship between kidneys and digestive tract when it comes to knowing how much water to pick up. Then we have the cecum which is a pouch-like opening to the large intestine. Intestine, that's fun. Because why not? I'll just make up my own spelling. Okay, so the cecum is right there. Okay, notice that the small intestine is coming here, and the small intestine empties out into the cecum. Okay, all right. We have the appendix, um, which is essentially this little guy here. It's a little finger-like outcropping. It's a little extension um, of the cecum itself. For a really long time, um, science and medicine weren't really sure what the appendix did because it's one of those things that can be removed with basically no negative side effects at all. The body seems to continue to function without any hindrance. Um, things like your gallbladder can be removed as well, but because that's where all the bile is stored and then secreted into the small intestines, you usually have to watch your fat intake because you don't have all of that there to, all the, the bile there to help break down the lipids. But the appendix, you can apparently take and not have any of those types of issues. However, it's now believed that um, we have a lot of um, immune cells for that part of the body that are stored here in the appendix and that it can also act as a reservoir for the healthy bacteria that we should have in our gut. Uh, these words out loud with me so you can say that you got to say them all within like a 15 minute period. Okay, here comes another good word, you ready? 
So the rectum compacts feces. And as if that job was not exciting enough, it also gets to regulate defecation. Oh, that is the word I left off of my list. Do you think the body has like meetings where all of the internal organs get together and like, so what's your job man? And the rectum's like, you yeah, get to uh, compact feces and regulate defecation. That's our job, so he's gotta do it. Okay. Um, the anus with its sphincter muscles. I couldn't help myself, I giggled a little bit. Okay, so um, here's the rectum part over here. Um, there are two sphincters, the internal anal sphincter, which as you might guess is farther internally, farther inside, and then the external anal sphincter, which is the one that is right by the anus. Okay, um, the colon or the, the large intestine itself is often just referred to as the colon and you do have the ascending colon. The transverse colon grows, goes across the horizontally and then the descending colon, it goes down. You have the loop that's the sigmoid colon which drops into the rectum. And there you go, there was your tour of the large intestine. Um, The, as I'm sure you're aware, but the small intestines are tucked in here, right? All 18 feet, quink, and then empties into here. Okay. It's like Sesame Street. Our word of the day is sphincter. Brought to you by the letter S. Now we get to talk about large intestine disorders. Okay. We've already had the pleasure of talking about diarrhea when we were talking about the small intestine and some of the issues associated with lactose intolerance. Um, however, it's also commonly caused by infections of the lower GI tract, gastrointestinal tract. Um, and infections include viruses and bacteria, parasites, um, stuff like that amoebic dysentery. Yes, it's a real thing. Um, okay, so the irritation caused by the infection and the inflammation and all of that increases peristalsis, which is, remember, that smooth muscle contraction along the length of the um, intestines, and that disruption keeps water from being absorbed as it should be. Then, of course, you have the opposite, which I've already had the pleasure of talking about on the last page. Um, this is the opposite, again, where um, uh, there's not enough water dehydration. that one yet. Okay. Hemorrhoids. 
the state keeps getting better and better. I, I love teaching this particular lecture. Get to say all these words. Okay. Uh, so what are hemorrhoids, you ask? Again, I'm glad that you came up with that question because I'm going to tell you they're enlarged and inflamed blood vessels at the anus. So think about the walls of blood vessels um, and what happens is strain of any kind can put pressure on these blood vessels and they become enlarged. So they kind of bulge out, um, which can cause pain, bleeding, stuff like that. Um, strain can be caused by any number of things, including um, um, constipation, excess diarrhea, because that's more of the irritation then. No, that's not how it works. Um, what else? Pregnancy. Pregnancy can cause it, and that has to do with how baby sits, and baby puts all that pressure way down low. Some people are genetically disposed to it. Okay. Um, polyps. Cancerous, can, cancerous. Cancerous growth of the colon epithelial cells. This is one of the reasons that people do colonoscopies to look for and remove polyps, okay? Um, If it's not treated, it can go deeper into the layers, into the submucosa, and then from there can metastasize um, or move to other parts of the body. So, like all cancers, it needs to be detected early and treated. Okay. Um, chances can be increased by having a higher uh, dietary fat intake. So remember that um, bile is what's responsible for breaking down fats. If you have a higher fat diet, it creates more bile, and they're showing a link between that and the development of these polyps. Um, a high fiber diet helps to reduce the risk. Um, this has been fun, a tour of the GI tract. I hope you all had fun with me today as we did that as well. And I'll talk to you soon. I've got one more lecture coming up this week. Have a good rest of your day.